But onto the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located in your neck. So if you find your Adam's apple, which women have too, it's just smaller in women, um, right below the Adam's apple in that area is where the thyroid gland is located. And it kind of wraps around the trachea. It has two lobes. One goes kind of to each side of the trachea. And what the thyroid gland does is it produces those hormones T3 and T4 that we saw in the first video for this chapter. Um, these were examples of hormones that can cross the plasma membrane of cells and then once they're inside of the cell they end up um, activating transcription inside of the nucleus so these upregulate gene expression and this is very important just for normal growth and development um, for stimulating protein synthesis and this is also something that helps to establish our basal metabolic rate um, so if there's not enough of these Pro these hormones, um, what ends up happening is we, we, a lot of times, one of the symptoms is that people will feel kind of sluggish, they don't have enough energy, and that ties in directly with what these hormones are doing in the body. Um, there's also, there's another substance that is produced by the thyroid gland, it's called calcitonin, and this has a role in maintaining calcium levels in the blood, uh, but this is seems to be not as important of a role uh, of the thyroid gland in terms of maintaining phys normal physiology. So we're going to focus in on T3 and T4 primarily for this gland. So I want to start with showing you a picture of a cross-section of the thyroid gland. And what you'll see is there are many um, sort of spaces, many of these hollow spaces. These are called follicles. Each one is a follicle. It's made up of a space, a uh, fluid-filled space, and a lining of epithelial cells around it. So that whole thing makes up one follicle. Um, the substance in the middle is called colloid, and it is lined by follicular, follicular cells. So what I'd like to do is just zoom in on one of these follicles and take a look at what's happening inside of the colloid. Um, keep in mind that, that there is a blood supply to this gland, so there are blood vessels that innervate um, through this tissue, and that blood supply is very critical because it's the thing that's bringing iodine to the thyroid. Um, so out here in the space surrounding this follicle would be blood plasma. And again, that's going to be where um, iodine is at. As long as we have iodine in our diets, then it's going to be in the blood as well. And what the follicular cells do is they actively take up this iodine. They take it into the colloid space. Um, I think this is transported with sodium. It's a sodium symport channel that, that brings that in. Um, but anyway, iodine is recruited into the colloid space. And then inside of the colloid, what happens is it gets combined with a protein called thyroglobulin. This is produced by the follicular cells these cells around the edge. Um, and so the combination of those things, iodide and thyroglobulin, that ends up allowing us to produce T3 and T4. Those numbers are just indicating how many iodines are attached onto that particular molecule. So T3 and T4, those are hanging out in the colloid space and they're, they're kept there kind of in reserve. We have a a reserve supply so that if your dietary iodine dips low for a while um, we still have some reserves of these hormones available. So um, when will these be released? These are going to be released when thyroid stimulating hormone binds to the thyroid gland. There are receptors for thyroid stimulating hormone and um, this ultimately this comes from the pituitary gland which is in turn triggered by the hypothalamus um, okay so if tsh thyroid stimulating hormone binds to its receptors then that will cause these follicular cells to endocytose t3 and t4 from the colloid space by the way there is a typo in this figure let me just point it out to you right here this arrowhead should not be here. You know, what's gonna happen is T3 and T4 are going to travel in this direction. They'll be endocytosed by these cells and then ultimately transported out uh, into the blood plasma. So T3 and T4 um, end up in the blood plasma and usually they get attached to a carrier protein. And from there, they travel through the bloodstream um, off to all of their target cells throughout the body. So that is what's going on in a colloid, inside of a follicle, um, in the colloid space is where these hormones are being produced. So problems with the thyroid gland, 
Now that we understand sort of how it normally functions, let's think about some problems that can come up. One is just if there's not enough iodine in the diet, um, in the long term what that's going to lead to is an inability to make enough thyroid hormone, right? Because iodine is one of the ingredients there. So let's come over to the schematic on the side. Um, ordinarily, the hypothalamus triggers the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. That binds at the thyroid and causes T3 and T4 to be released. All right, that's what we just saw. All right, so um, if these levels start to get too high, then what will happen is there's a negative feedback control system here. Um, these hormones can negatively uh, feedback to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. So that's going to decrease the amount of thyroid stimulating hormone that's produced. However, um, if our bodies are not able to make enough T3 and T4, so if there's not enough iodine in our diets, then what will happen um, is there's no negative feedback going on. So instead, the anterior pituitary will continue to produce TSH and that is going to cause the thyroid to grow. Remember we said that um, all of these hormones that we've been talking about, these are trophic hormones. They cause their target organs to grow if they're present in large amounts. So TSH is going to make the thyroid grow um, if we have insufficient iodine in the diet. And this is called goiter. So here's a picture of a woman with goiter. Um, this is a very enlarged thyroid gland in the neck. And this is due to, oh, this is high, this is a goiter due to um, dietary insufficiency of iodine. So um, where does iodine come from? It's in the soil in certain areas. And so if you have plants that are growing in that fertile soil that has iodine, um, then if we eat the fruits and the, the vegetables that grow in that soil, then we get iodine in our diets that way. There are certain regions in the world where there just isn't quite as much iodine, and so this tends to come up more in some places than others. Um, if you if you next time you're buying salt in the grocery store you'll notice they sell plain salt and then they also sell iodized salt so if you're concerned about not getting enough iodine in your diet you can just buy the iodized salt and that'll get you a, a good supply this isn't a real common problem in the u.s i would say um but it isn't in certain other areas of the world so what this can lead to in terms of symptoms, in addition to just seeing an enlarged thyroid, this can also lead to a number of other things, low metabolic rates, um, weight gain, lethargy, not feeling like you have enough energy to do things, right? Because there's not enough T3 reaching to your cells, causing upregulation of protein production. If hypothyroidism takes place um, at a very young age, so during pregnancy, or soon after birth, this can lead to a very serious problem. So this is called cretinism. And um, think about what's happening during this stage. So from like the first trimester of pregnancy through after childbirth, through like six months of age, what's happening? That's really the key time where the nervous system is developing. And so if we don't have enough, um, if there's not sufficient thyroid hormone present for the baby at that period of time in life. Um, this can lead to very severe um, disabilities, physical and mental as well, um, because again, the, the, the gene expression is so dependent on these hormones just throughout the body, nervous system included. So that's cretinism due to hypothyroidism at a young age. Okay, um, going to the other extreme, hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, this is referring to basically the thyroid producing too much thyroid hormone. So why would this come up? Um, there is an autoimmune condition that can lead to this. It's called Graves' disease. And what happens is the antibodies in the body, um, the antibodies bind to the TSH receptors in the thyroid gland. So, right, TSH, this is the thing that's usually produced by the pituitary gland, and it activates the thyroid gland to do its job. So, if, um, if those receptors are being activated, then as far as the thyroid gland is concerned, it just needs to be making thyroid hormone. So, it's going to produce a lot of T3 and a lot of T4, and this is due to the antibodies binding to these receptors. The antibodies aren't supposed to do this, um, but they are in this case. So, that stimulates overproduction of thyroid hormones, 
Um, meanwhile, interesting note is that the TSH levels are extra low, right? Because if there are a lot of T3 and T4 hormones being released, then those are in circulation in the blood and that's going to act like a negative feedback loop. That's going to tell the pituitary gland to not secrete TSH. So TSH is very low. However, thyroid hormone production remains very high because those antibodies are triggering this to take place. So this is called Graves' disease. This leads to uh, a lot of symptoms that are, in, in some ways, they're like the other extreme compared to hypothyroidism. So metabolic rate is higher than normal. Um, protein production is higher than normal. This ends up leading to anatomical changes. Here's a picture of a woman with Graves' disease. And you can see the eyes are kind of bulging. That's because the orbit of the eyes, um, it, anatomically, it has changed. That orbit has grown, and so the eyes end up kind of bulging out as a result of that. So that's another sort of extreme problem. Thyroid problems oftentimes can be managed um, very effectively with pharmaceuticals, um, either giving something that inhibits the thyroid gland or giving something that sort of replaces those thyroid hormones. Um, generally those are very successful treatment options.